19 people at the um, in Zoom. That means it's not such a hot topic anymore, which of course is glad because of the over the year and all the discussions, it's op open access is sort of on the verge to be accepted. So the 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 format of this workshop is that Laurence will give an introduction. Then really, uh, Egloff will present a uh, the a, a legal view from a European Swiss side. The Marika Kagabiyama will she will give uh, an introduction to the American side, and then we have question and answers for everybody. And once we conclude the question and answer question to more to questions which arise from these uh, presentations here, we'll present some recommendations we would like to uh, talk talk to you about and hopefully later publish. So we start. I give the word to Laurence Benichou. Thank you. You put the presentation, thank you. So uh, this is a quick introduction for the session. So it's more of a workshop. So we need you because we are going then to have a discussion. And at the end of it, we would like to put some recommendation on that. So the objective of the workflow of the workshop, sorry, is to provide first an overview of the legal rules governing scholarly um, data publication and uh, give an update of uh, directive and particularly uh, European directive on data within publication. We would like to raise awareness for participants and also for the community in regards to copyright. And at the end of it, I already said it, we would like to recommend best practice for publishers and authors so they can allow the extraction and dissemination of the data content within their publication. So the idea is clearly to allow them to feel free to extract the data and disseminate it. We would like to find an agreement for the community statement and development of goal lines for all the community and raise awareness for an approach that implements um, legal and data protection keeping in mind that data is to be open as possible and as close as necessary. So um, Donat already talked about the structure of the workshop. After my introduction, we will have an overview uh, by Willie Egloff that I would like to thank you very much for uh, being with us. So he will give us an overview of the European regulation in terms of data. And then we will have a contribution by Mary Cook with, uh, who is online, so uh, thank you, Mariko, in advance. And then we will have a discussion moderated by Donut and recommendation that uh, should be finalized just after the workshop, we hope so, and that uh, Duta will um, moderate as well. So first of all, I would like to precise what we are talking about. We are talking about scholarly publication, articles, monographs, peer-reviewed or not, most of them are peer-reviewed, containing biodiversity information, and more specifically, data content within those publications, such as the taxonomic name, the taxonomic treatment, the authority of the name, the material examine, including the identifiers, but also photographs and figures content within those, um, those uh, articles and monographs. So, so far, my understanding of the copyright is here, um, the journal and the books are copyrighted. The data content within the publication are not. But I hope Willie will explain that better than I do. So more precisely, here is an example of four pages, of very classical flora. So it's um, um, taxon on uh, a plant. Uh, it has been published in Flora of Cambodia, uh, co-published by three institutions. So it's a very classical four pages about a species uh, describing the name of it, the synonymy list, and the material studied, um, the drawing, the photographs content uh, within it that explain the uh, species and precise it. But what are we going to do with it? 
Once it's published, we extract everything from it. We extract the treatment citation. We extract the name. We put DUI and identifier everywhere where we can. And then we also extract the figures. We extract the drawing. We extract the materials studied and push everything to GBIF and all relevant databases that we can. We put identifier everywhere where we can, in the material citation, in the institution code, in the specimen code, because those are the data we need afterwards. So first we publish, then we extract and reuse the data. That's the idea. But we might have some legal problem with it. So the general aspect to clarify, and as we um, once again thank in advance Willie and Mariku that they are going to clarify that for us, is what is the current legal landscape within national, regional context regarding data and scholarly publication and um, give us an update of the European directive from two years ago. Also French legislation, which is very in favor of data and text mining. Similar law that might occur in Europe, in the USA. We know that publishing is governed by the Bern Convention on Copyright. When we publish normally, the law prevailing is the one of the publisher where you publish but in terms of extraction data, it's not where it has been published, but where it extracted that is going to be important. So we'd like also uh, those legal experts to clarify for, um, for us, sorry, um, the publisher point of view and see the publisher point of view based on the type of data that we are going to extract, uh, including the figures and photographs which were not so clear in terms of copyright, but also clarify if there's any national location uh, relevant for copyright purpose. And if the status of legacy publication versus prospective publication is relevant or not. So the general aspects that we would like to discuss with you afterwards is trying to do a best practice or to have a standardized recommendation that will facilitate the dissemination and reuse of the biodiversity data. What element can such a standardized recommendation content based, of course, of the, uh, on the blue list uh, that you can find on the Platzi platform? Uh, we would like also to discuss if there is any published data that should not be open from the community point of view and how we should identify such data. And uh, to finish with, if we do have the power to shape data accessibility and reusability and how. So I would like first to acknowledge the fact that this workshop has been an ID uh, provided by three communities, Spinach Publishing Community members, the CTAF e-publishing working group members, and the BHL members. So I'd like to give the floor to Willie. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to uh, start with reminding some really very basics of copyright. And the most important one is that copyright refers to works. If there is no work, there is no copyright. And the work is not anything, but a work is an original production in the artistic or literary domain. It uh, contains also uh, scientific literature. In the United States, there is a supplementary requirement. Only works that are fixed in a tangible medium are protected. 
for example, in the United States, uh, improvised music is not protected or a pantomime is not protected. So already here you see there are differences between uh, the countries about what is protected and what not. Uh, work uh, is protected if it requires the condition of originality. That means it contains creative choices. And uh, I cite here one of the most prominent uh, professors of uh, copyright, uh, Daniel Gervais of the Vanderbilt University. And he has defined this originality in negative way. It is original if it is not the decide dictated by the function of the work, by the method or technique used, or by applicable standards or relevant good practice. And if you think about it, you already see that the more scientific, the less original uh, a work is. I'm sorry, was the wrong button. Protected is the work and the work as a whole. Parts of the works are only protected if these parts are works in themselves. That is very important. It is clear that uh, the single words of a work or the single uh, letters of a work are not protected. The difference is there where you have an original work in the part, then it's protected. If the, it is not original, then it's not protected. And that makes the difference that uh, Laurence already talked about. Publications normally are works. Scientific data normally are not. And that was the idea behind the blue list that uh, we published some years ago. I don't know when. Uh, it listed uh, taxonomic data that never is uh, can be a protect a copyrightable work because it's a standardized information. Liberating uh, taxonomic data from publications means, therefore, extracting non-protected data from protected publications. That is, from a copyright view, is the matter we are discussing about. And this process, as the publication as a whole is protected, needs an authorization. And an authorization can be a contractual authorization, or it can be a legal license. A contractual authorization means the right holder has given you the authorization to use it. A legal license means the law itself gives you that authorization. And uh, you don't need the, uh, the consent of any person, not even the right holder. And what's new in the European Union is that since 2019, we have uh, new articles in the Copyright Directive, and especially we have a, a norm that says text and data mining for the purposes of scientific research must be allowed by an overruling legal, legal license. It means every country of the European Union has to implement in its copyright law a disposition that says text and data mining for the purposes of scientific research is allowed and it has to, say, to fix that uh, uh, contractual agreements that say something else, are overruled, so they are not enforceable. 
And in Article 4, there is written that the, the countries have to introduce uh, a subsidiary legal license for every other form of uh, text and data mining. So this uh, legal license is applicable only uh, in cases where there is no uh, contrary agreement between the parties. I have to admit that uh, up to now, I think 14 of the 27 countries in the EU have implemented this norm. Also, the delay is, is over since last year. So there is a certain delay in the implementation, but within three, four years, this rule where will uh, be applicable in the whole uh, European Union. The result is that we have a legal divide. In the European Union, extracting data for the purposes of scientific research is allowed by law, by an overruling legal license. In the United States, extracting data for uh, the purpose of scientific research is allowed by contractual uh, agreement or in the cases of fair use. And in the rest of the world, there might be any solution, uh, probably more in direction of the United States, but the, the national copyright law around the world differs enormously. Important, the legal divide refers only to this extraction process. Once the research data is, or the, the scientific data is legally extracted, then this data can be used worldwide without any restriction. Again, under the condition that these data are not works in themselves. And with the exception, that they are sensitive data in any aspect, but that has nothing to do with copyright. There are other protection schemes like the protection of endangered species, but it is wrong to link that to copyright. You should never do that. It is also not a question of copyright if you give attribution to the source of the data, but it is a scientific requisition. It is scientific good practice to, uh, that you uh, give attribution, that you cite your source also for non-copyrighted, uh, copyright protected data. And I finish with the conclusion that I take from this uh, the, the situation, uh, if you do extraction of scientific data, please clarify if your national copyright law allows it. And if it does not allow it, try to realize this extraction in a, uh, in a, a jurisdiction where it is allowed. For example, by cooperating with an institution in Europe. The, the criterion is where is the responsibility for the extraction process. It doesn't matter where your computer is located. It's really the institution that is responsible for the extraction process. Cite the source of the extracted data. And if you reuse the extracted data for a known publication, please make this publication accessible under a CCBY license or uh, under a CCO uh, zero waiver. And especially if you, uh, if you make the data, uh, the extracted data accessible, so make clear that this is free stuff that can be used by everybody. For example, by adding a CCO waiver. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you.
Probably just a question. Is it on? No. Okay. Probably just a question to really to clarify. What is scientific research in that context? In the EU, scientific research is uh, research done by a uh, scientific organization. Uh, it sounds uh, strange, but it is like that. In this directive, it said that scientific uh, this uh, norm applies to scientific organizations. And then you have a long definition of what is a scientific definition, a scientific organization. It excludes commercial research. That, for example, is a difference between uh, Switzerland and uh, the European Union. In Switzerland, the exception refers explicitly to any form of research, also. Uh, commercial research and that in the meaning that there is no difference or there is no no clear no possibility to to split the one from the other because uh, research today is is uh, made in private public partnership and uh, you cannot uh, talk anymore about uh, a clear university um uh, research and this discussion is on in the european union too so in some countries have transformed this directive without the great criteria of the the non-commercial uh, research thank you for that with that i would give the word to marika to explain the American position. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. So my name is Mariko Kageyama. I am based in uh, Seattle on the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Um, I'm a licensed to practice law in the United States, specifically state of Washington and New York. Uh, but I'm relatively new to the legal field. Um, I am uh, just passed the bar exam a few years ago. So uh, my knowledge is not as uh, full as uh, the, uh, what uh, Willie uh, demonstrated, but I tried to explain that some um, US legal landscape with regard to copyright and licensing uh, in relation to our scientific research activities. Uh, I'm very thrilled to be part of this conversation with you and uh, I hope it's a more interactive and uh, uh, will contribute to the, uh, the, you know, some um, recommendations uh, all together. So first of all, I uh, unfortunately I didn't prepare the slides, but I'll try to follow the some outline that uh, really just that uh, presented and uh, following up with the uh, main points. Um, first of all, the uh, United States uh, obviously is uh, different from the EU or other countries uh, in terms of the law and policy. And uh, uh, the, uh, st the very basic starting point for the copyright law in the United States is that the United States Constitution clearly uh, uh, states that uh, copyright is protected, as in the uh, Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution says that Congress, United States Congress, shall have power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries. So uh, under this uh, constitutional provisions, the United States uh, copyright law has been legislated under the United States uh, Code, uh, Title 17 of the US Code. 
And uh, United States also that the, one of the countries who uh, that are party to the Bern uh, Convention or international copyright treaties with a lot of amendments. But uh, at the same time, US one of the last developed countries uh, that joined the Bern Convention. So um, there are a lot of differences in approaching the copyright issues. And also the another main, ish, main difference with the EU is that um, like the United Kingdom, the US is also the common law jurisdictions. So that uh, in addition to constitution and the uh, statutory law, the legislation, uh, the law is a very actively developed through the uh, court opinions or the judge-made law so that uh, you are required to analyze the law uh, not through the legislative uh, statutory language in text, but also you need to analyze the law as um, you know, determined by the judges in courts, including the Supreme Court and the lower courts. So the, um, let's start with the uh, definition uh, The uh, Willie mentioned that the, the, in the US copyright refers to works, but the, uh, only protect if it's fixed in a tangible medium. And uh, uh, that's true. And uh, uh, copyright uh, applies to the um, uh, only um, original works of authorship uh, fixed in any uh, medium of expression. And then so um, the, there are a lot of uh, interpretations and uh, even the court fight over the each little term, including what fixed means, what tangible medium means, what's the, you know, what's the exactly the copyright protects. And uh, so um, copyright ability, uh, according to the uh, US Copyright Act of the 1976, uh, probably it's easier to uh, list out the what's not copyrightable. And then that's um, ideas, concepts, discoveries, um, process, procedures, methods, systems, designs, and so forth. And uh, in addition to facts. So uh, the the scientific data, as we are most interested in, uh, likely fall under you know those uh, unco no, not copyrightable copyright, not protected by the copyright uh, categories. However, um, copyright laws are also uh, very flexible in terms of um, uh, interpretation. So uh, rather than EU, uh, as uh, Willie said, that it has an EU directive that you know that uh, allow that the text and data mining um, activity uh, under that the EU legislation, the US law uh, doesn't have equivalent uh, statutory uh, or legislative uh, law, but rather uh, US courts uh, analyze and interpret in a way that allows for scientific um, you know, knowledge building uh, in balance uh, against the protection of the copyrights. And so the um, still uh, arguable and then it's contentious area of law, it's not set in stone, but the extracting act of the extracting data is um, not an act 
of in, infringement, copyright infringement, um, because um, there are three levels of analysis. One is this, uh, no, whether the, the data extracted uh, are copyrightable or not. And uh, the second is that uh, whether the acts of uh, extracting data or the preparing data for that purpose, and then um, you know, saving, possibly saving the data for data validation. Uh, those uh, activities, you know, design of the conducting research uh, fall under the uh, com copyright infringement. And the third uh, uh, point of analysis, uh, even if the uh, acts of copying and you know uh, copyrighted works are uh, infringing under the uh, definition of the U.S. copyright law, still that act could be uh, uh, defensible uh, as a non-infringement under the uh, probably unique U.S doctrine of the fair use. Um, so that each you know, three steps analysis are uh, important and a pretty uh, lengthy uh, analysis that I may omit at this point, but the fair use analysis is probably one of the things that, that you may be most interested. And uh, uh, fair use analysis it's uh, in that 17, uh, Title 17 of the U.S. Code and Section 107. And then that the, uh, this uh, fair use doctrine or the analysis has been developed by the courts, uh, judgment law. And then that has been codified later by the U.S. Congress. So now it's written in the statute. But the date uh, that uh, doctrine provides uh, um, four main factors to analyze whether even if you are making a copies uh, of the copyrighted works, still that falls under non-infringement as a defense against the losses. So um, the four factors under the fair use analysis is that the first that you look at the uh, purpose and character of your uh, how how data is used, how work is copied, and second factor is that the nature of the copyrighted work itself, whether it's a journal articles or books or the copyrightable some material, and that. Third factor is that the amount and substantiality of the portion of the material that's being used and copied relative to the original whole copyrighted works. So that whether that the portion is a full text scanning of the documents or the just extraction only that data smallest elements and so forth. And that the last fourth factor analysis of the fair use is that the impact effect on the potential market or the value of the copyrighted works. So that's a more uh, economic analysis. Uh, and then these uh, four factors uh, all are combined uh, give you that the high chance that the scientific research and then conducting the text and data mining from the scientific or scholarly publications uh, likely uh, fall under the um, uh, fair use. And so relatively low risk, although it's not the risk-free. And so you, you can safely conduct such research uh, without fear of the copyright infringement. So uh, again, that, that's a lot of a complicated uh, theory and practice behind the US copyright law, but I'll stop there to uh, encourage further discussion.
Well, thank you, Marika, for this uh, American re explanation to copyright. Um, I assume there are some questions in the room now. So one question that came up in both on both um, on Slack and in in Zoom was, so if what's decisive now? If I'm in the States, can I use a machine in Europe and take some data mine, or do I have to to be in Europe or and use an American machine? What's possible? What's not possible? Yeah, I think I have answered it already. The location of the machine doesn't matter at all. It is the responsibility for the extraction process that is decisive. If you, the organization uh, that extracts is situated in Germany, then it's German law that applies. If the uh, organization is situated in France, then it's French law that applies. And if it is situated in the United States, then it's the uh, the right of the United States that uh, applies. What means location? If, if, for example, I have a grant and I live in France, but I spend my time to text and data mining in Switzerland. Is do I text and data mine in Switzerland, or is French legislation responsive or uh, decisive? Question: Who is who? You. <laughs> <laughs> if you Donat Agosti do it in Switzerland with a French uh, uh, grant, then you are in Switzerland. If you live, if you are a resident in France and you do it, uh, your work there, and then you're a French resident and you, uh, it's French law that applies. So, uh, but normally it's not as an individual person, but it's an organization that uh, does that work and uh, a university or uh, uh, another organization. And then it's the uh, the place where this uh, organization is installed. But is funding decisive or not? No, funding is. It doesn't matter where the money comes from. It the important thing is who does the extraction work. So to precise again the question, in terms of location, let's have a case user. If I process, so you said the, what's important is the location of the, the process. If I process it remotely from France to, to, to Platzi treatment bank, for instance, which law applies? I'm in France, but I do that remotely. I extract the data remotely into a server. You think if you do that for Platzi in France, yeah. yeah, then it's Platzi that is decisive. No? It's the organization that is responsible for the extraction process. It doesn't matter where the computer is. It doesn't matter where the person is located that uh, does the work. It's the organization that is responsible. I admit that in some cases that might be a little bit difficult as in, in modern times, because these organizations may be in, in different uh, locations. Do you mean location by discount of the company or location as a physical presence of the office of the company? The first one, the legal installment, if it is not abusive. Huh? If you have your uh, publishing house here in Bulgaria and your firm is installed in the Cayman Island, then it might be a certain risk. So. I have a question. And so I'm an independent scientist, so I'm independent professional. 
Um, my question is, am I doing scientific research with regard to the EU directive? Because I'm not an accredited science institution. And that's where I kind of like the US approach, which says fair use is for the public good, for the public benefit. Mm -hmm. And the EU seems to be very narrow onto some kind of definition of scientific um, institution. So I'm wondering. Yeah, that's a serious problem. <laughs> um, following the European directive, probably you are not a research organization. And this restriction, it's clear the uh, the big publishing houses, they have their word to say in Brussels. So uh, it was a long debate and I think it's, you are rather not in. But the, the member states of the European Union, they have to implement this rule in their law. And if you are in Germany, you have to see what is the the precise implementation of this uh, disposition in Germany. And uh, um, I, I don't have the, the overview uh, actually, but I think for example, in France, you could do that, but not in Germany. I'm not sure for Germany, for France, I'm quite sure. Any more questions? or comments? Cannot sit down, really. Um, there's one more question is, your work is for literature and artistic work. What is science, not, why is science not mentioned? Um, this has historical uh, reasons. And it goes far back to the creation of the Berne Convention in 1883, huh? 86, 83 was the first Swiss copyright law. And there was a dispute between France and uh, Germany about the title of this convention. And then they made a compromise form that is protection of artistic and literary work. That's all. But already in the very first uh, Bern convention, convention, the protection referred also to works like technical plans and, and things like that. So don't bother about these notions. They have no meaning at all. I have another question for you, Willie. So don't sit down, please. <laughs> so just to be sure we understand and very precisely, um, it means that if I understand correctly, we can extract data, providing that we process that under a European country that allows it. Does it apply also to all kind of publication or should I just focus on open access publication or can I also extract data on a non-accessible publication? As I said, this rule is a overruling legal license. That means it is applicable Never, uh, not regarding whatever the private have uh, decided or agreed uh, upon. So you can extract a non accessible uh, publication under one condition you must have a, uh, a legal access to it. Huh? You, you cannot go to a library shop if there are scientific uh, yet uh, scientific publications you cannot go there and steal a book and uh, and uh, extract data but if you have uh, a lawful access to that book and that you have you have it for example as a 
uh, user of a library, then uh, you can extract it even if there is written in the book that is not allowed in European countries. <laughs> Um, there's one more question regarding legal access. So is what means legal access? Does Sci-Hub, using Sci-Hub, is it legal or not? Shall I? Do you want to say something? <laughs> I mean, uh, no answer to that. So, uh, huh? well, we can say because in Switzerland, access is what? Yeah, the, the question is a little bit difficult because we all know that SciHub uh, reproduces illegally uh, uh, an awful lot of stuff, of scientific stuff. And they do it illegally. It's there is no doubt about it. And what the effect may, might be for the use of this illegal copied stuff, again depends from is differs from country to country. For example, in Germany, you have a, a, a rule that you cannot use. Uh, material that has been obviously illegally uh, put uh, up, uh, been uploaded on, on the net. So you cannot use it and is obviously illegal. In Switzerland, that is not the case. You can download it for personal purposes. And now the question is, is your research a personal purpose? I would doubt about it. There's a, another question from the, the Zoom chat. Um, so Jurid asks, many folks have different affiliations. How does that transfer from a legal perspective? Let's say I have an affiliation with an US institution and EU institution how to decide which law applies. Yeah, what does affiliation mean? If you are a, an affiliated researcher to, to the National History Museum, you are not working for the National History Museum. So, uh, um, you really, you would have to, to look at the concrete case Um, the work that that person does is made in in the responsibility uh, responsibility of somebody, probably of himself. So it's himself that matters. But if this work is done, as the the case of Lawrence, if he does something in on behalf of the National History Museum, then it's the National History Museum. I really, I, sh I should know more exactly the, how the situation is. Hi, Dimitri from Belgium. I, I was just wondering how many cases are already in court about this? So what's actually the real consequence of doing uh, these transcriptions, transcriptions or not? Any idea? I can say that in Platzi, we do that for 14 years now, and we had never had uh, any problem. No, not even uh, somebody who said we have infringed copyright. So uh, I don't think that the problem is, uh, is huge, but uh, 
if I remember well, there was something with a, a photo put on the Tedwick website. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Tedwick paid something for, um, for not being sued. I really would have liked very much that they would have resisted because I'm quite sure that they would have won, especially because the, the upload was done in Denmark and that is one of the most liberal uh, copyright countries we have. So that raises another question in my mind, maybe it's to you to not, but it's a two-part question. One, have you ever decided not to extract information from a document for fear of a potential lawsuit? And if so, or even if not, could you provoke a lawsuit to get the ends that you were just desiring by pushing some boundaries somewhere and get it actually in case law? I have never extracted anything <laughs> because I'm the lawyer. <laughs> um, no, but in the case there would be a problem, for example, with this photo, I would say take it down and try to avoid any uh, court action because it's expensive. Uh, but if I would have been sued, I, I would resist. I would never pay. I would never pay because I would never admit that it is uh, an infringement of copyright. We have a, we have a question from Mari or Mariko raised her hand on the on on Zoom. Okay, so uh, as I said earlier, that in response to some lawsuit and case law. So the U.S. is very litigious country, but at, so at the same time, uh, the, the lawsuit actually that uh, um, contribute a whole lot to the development of a copyright law. And especially in, in, in line with the, um, the country's um, innovation policy uh, to get the uh, international um, competitive advantage in the uh, digital economy as well as in the innovation in science and technology. And so um, there are a lot of uh, case laws that precedents that apply to the United States Copyright Act that actually uh, help the scientists to do that, uh, what they want to do. Uh, for example, uh, Google has been a major player in the development of copyright law. Um, as you might have heard that uh, Google has been sued many times by the um, co pro-copyright group, such as authors guilds and you know, publishers with the copyright, you know, strong copyright interest. And uh, uh, one, thing, uh, one famous case is uh, Google has been sued by the authors guild along with the uh, academic libraries, dozens of academic libraries and uh, publishers. And uh, uh, interestingly that, that, you know, the claim was that the obvious uh, copyright infringement when they uh, scanned and text mined all the uh, you know, library books so that uh, uh, you know, data user and the consumer, we can search uh, certain you know, tiny snippets of the text data out of the uh, scanned books. And then, so the Google and the academic libraries, uh, you know, under their uh, agreements, did that scan, but without obtaining any licenses from those book publishers or journal publishers. So they got angry and sued the Google or the library group. And uh, uh, turned out that court uh, favored uh, Google's use is uh, fair use, even though you know the act could fall under the uh, you know um, commercial activities. Google is a for-profit you know corporation, 
And without license, they did a scan and mine the text and data out of the huge volume of the literary materials that are copyrighted, but still uh, they won in the lawsuits. And that contributed to the understanding of the uh, how the fair use is applied. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, more recent uh, case law that's been still um, developed in development is that uh, whether the uh, computer programs, in particular software, uh, API is copyrightable or not. And so um, again, the Google has been sued by Oracle uh, over the uh, API written in Java. And uh, basically the Google uh, without uh, license developed the, the Android platform using the uh, Java uh, API originally belonged to the uh, Oracle. And uh, still the, um, the court uh, concluded that Google's use of the uh, software, particular API, it uh, falls under the fair use. And uh, the court in this case uh, actually skipped that copyrightability analysis of the uh, software or API, but rather they jumped straight into the analysis of the fair use. And uh, so that um, as, as you as a you know, biodiversity data scientist are probably more familiar than me about the API and how it's composed. And actually the computer programs under the US law falls under the category of the literary works uh, as opposed to graphical or the artwork or the motion you know, films. So there are you know, dozen different categories of the uh, uh, works that are protected under the copyright law, but copy computer programs fall under the literary works and at the same time that you know, computer software, including API and some systems uh, can be dissected into the copyrightable portions. And then that's contained some expressive, you know, create, creative uh, elements, as well as non-copyrightable elements, such as just mere functions, you know, mere processing, mere methods. And so the uh, court, as well as you know, we are struggling how to apply the copyright protectability to the computer programs. And uh, in the case of Google v Oracle, uh, court applied uh, court uh, implied that the declaring court, you know, when you dissect the uh, uh, API that Google copied over from the uh, Oracle. Uh, the declaring code portion, which com uh, consists of only less than 1% the whole programming code. Uh, and that portion is probably not copyrightable. Whereas the implementing code that co uh, consists of majority of the code uh, may be copyrightable. Uh, regardless of the, the you know, proportion or the purpose of the, you know, or the nature of the works and the copyrightability of the API, the court uh, decided that uh, Google's copying act is non-infringing fair use. So that's a major decision in you know, favor uh, of the, uh, you know, computer scientists who would like to promote the open science. And most recently still pending in the appellate court is uh, another uh, lawsuit, uh, SAS Institute v. World Programming Limited. And that's also the fighting of the copyrightability of the SAS you know, statistical you know, institutes uh, software program, including API. And then they argue that, you know, portion of the, if it's not entirety, but some portion 
of the uh, software programs because of the uh, original creative uh, uh, assemblage and compilation of the data uh, should be copyrightable and should be protected under the Copyright Act. So um, this case may go all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, you never know. But you know, th these are the just examples of how actively US courts are engaged in analyzing and developing the copyright law. And overall, it's, it's um, supportive of the scientific innovative activity using the you know, uh, scientific data and scientific research, including data mining and using use of the uh, machine learning or the AI. Those are the, the you know, uh, really in tension with the protection of the copyright, but the law must be in balance with the um, policy of uh, promoting science and technology and innovation. So that's an uh, important aspect. And uh, I can also add that uh, most recently, uh, only two months ago, the US Office of Science and Technology uh, that makes a major policy, national policy making, uh, issue the guideline to update the United States you know, national policy on science and technology and uh, to promote the open science and open data and public access to the federally, you know, US federally funded research and outcomes must be available to the American public, you know, taxpayers, uh, so that, the, you know, they want to improve the um, return on investment. So uh, one of the uh, concrete proposal in that guideline, updated guidelines issued a couple months ago is that uh, removing the embargo period. Uh, previously that the researchers allowed to uh, not publish or not you know, release the data uh, research outcomes uh, to gain the competitive advantage uh, using the embargo. Um, but uh, the new open science policy that federal government is pushing to um, activate through the US federal agencies is that uh, remove that embargo period of the one year and as, as immediately as possible that the researchers are requested to post and publish and uh, make available the, all the scientific data to the, you know, the public and through that uh, uh, public repositories. So that's uh, one, you know, policy movement that's uh, observed in the United States. Can you hear me? Okay, Mao, well, thanks for this extensive uh, answer. The one thing which strikes me always, we always take court law in the US and then talk about Google, it's like a, 100, 200, 300 billion dollar industry. And they have a problem to survive on a shoestring. And I'm, I really wonder whether this comparison is really helpful because, I mean, you, you mentioned that the, 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 the impact of this work in the financial side we do is sort of sub zero more or less. So I wonder whether this is really an issue to, to listen to or be worried about this possibility that we are sued but i'm not a lawyer i don't know um to answer rich's question i never I was never worried about do not, not something we rather thought it's more interesting to do things which might get controversy but we never caught one so unfortunately <laughs> really <laughs> but it's retired now so you, you need some work <laughs> No, but we, we so we, we will, the strategy is definitely it's not. So the strategy is to, to create corpora. So it's a research project. We take some data mine for that. So we can explain why we do that. So it's not just we, we go for Elsevier or whatever, and then get all things down. And another reason I think which is important is that we, actually make something we take work out what really 
calls uh, fair fair work. So we add a lot of metadata to an article because we find out what's in the article, we add metadata so we know. And not only do we add metadata, we also made this data accessible. So we add the UIs and make them fair objects, which is like you, you put a lot of outside places where which generates or can generate traffic to um, to these publications. I have one more question is, yes, we can do, obviously, in many ways, text and data mine, but there's a problem that some of the publishers, they shut down the operations if you use too much, download too many PDFs or too many data. What can we do against Can you hear me? No. You can hear me? Okay. No, the, this is a more, more the opposite question. What can I do if the publishers does not allow me to do text and data mine, although I have the right to do it? Is there a way to against that? Or what can we do? Elsevier, for example, it shuts down if you start to download a huge amount of publications. What do you do for text and data mine? If I understood clearly the recommendation by Willie, you just ask one of the institution that has subscribed to Elsevier, journal you want, and you can have all you want. If you have legal access to it, so just ask the Paris library to give it to you and that will be done. So you don't have to ask elsewhere. You subscribe to a journal and then you, you have legal access to it and you can extract all the data you want. Yeah, but the case is if you start to download like all, all publication of a journal, then ah. they stop. Old publication. Yeah, I say I need all the publication from Journal X, and then they at some point they stop. They do not allow, allow you to do it, although you have legal access to it. That's the point. Okay. We have another uh, raised hand from. No, I think I'm. <laughs> I think I just want to to say what what Donna just mentioned. Um, it doesn't matter if you have a subscription to the journal; they will shut you down if there is too much traffic coming from your servers. Um, no matter if you if you subscribed the the titles or not. We. So it was just my 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 comment on on um, Laurence's uh, um, advice that Donna um, also answered. And what did you do after, like, if you have the experience with that, what did you do? Did you call them or how did you resolve that? Well, it was not my library, <laughs> um, yet the um, the colleague who told me about the situation said that she got a message from, uh, from the publisher and they were just asking why there was so much traffic uh, coming from their institution. And um, I think they somehow said they would just stop it and they were fine with this then but that was some years ago i'm not sure how they would react today so what one would need to communicate with them and explain and maybe also the situation changed so well yeah and in that case um the explanation was was fine and they kind of stopped the testing and they was they were happy with that okay thanks Okay, are there are any more questions here? If not, then we go over and Jutta will present a possible workflow, how to decide about um, copyright issues and also present the uh, recommendations.
Now I'll switch it off. Yeah. It's okay. Wait, this is like um, a war on a decision tree where we try to formulate what you, how you look at copyright issues and what you can make accessible, what not. So you should uh, read through that. And if you have any questions, then we'll, we can answer. The question is mostly to to Willy again. This is nice, very clear, but how to distinguish between narrative and data, between the published narrative and data? What is data? What is, let's say, text content? Yeah, I completely agree. I think. Um... Uh, this workflow starts from the idea that everything is protected and that is not the case. Uh, uh, the start is, did you collect the data? It means uh, if uh, you collected it, then you have the rights. And if not, somebody else has the right, but that is not correct. And uh, therefore the next question, does the data have a copyright? The license, probably not, because data have no copyright. So uh, <laughs> I think that is something weird in the, the start of this, uh, this workflow. It is correct from the moment that there is really a copyrighted work, but uh, the whole part of is there a copyrighted work is, is missing. Yeah. Are there any other comments? Yeah. Hello, I've got a question that might be really basic, but I've done a Creative Commons course, so that's why I'm here and interested in it. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering the reason for this step. Did you process the data? And if no, release it under CC0. Why is that? I didn't. What are you? So, did you process the data and no, release under CC0? Why would you release under CC0 as opposed to if you did process, you could choose? I think data must be released on the CC0 point. Full stop. So we, so this workshop actually um, is the result of a, a process over the past months um, where we try to, so as you maybe has recognized, if you maybe recognized, um, copyright is a rather complex issue and we were trying to find out, so how can we go forward? What can we recommend people? Um, what can we do? And so we, um we have um developed these recommendations that we would like to put forward to the community to you um and would like to discuss with you and um, develop them into a publication 
for um, the community to use. Um, so the first statement is that as scientific data users, um, we take the standpoint that scientific, scientific data is not copyrightable um, and that it can be as, uh, accessed, shared and reused freely. Um, so we take the standpoint, we consciously take the standpoint that data is open. So basically we are reiterating what is the situation. Um, but because I believe that many people actually don't know the, the situation. And that is of importance to four publications that already exist, so legacy publications. Um, if you want to extract data from publications that exist. Um, going forward, the situation is maybe easier because so what we recommend you to do um, with upcoming publication, prospective publications is um, we recommend as best practice for authors and also for public, uh, publishers to explicitly waive copyright to the data in the publications, not to the publications, but to the data in the publications. Um, and yeah, um, publishers um, ask them to also explicitly waive um, copyright to the data in, in their uh, publication portfolio, not to the publications, but to the data um, in the publications. Um, and to make this explicit and also machine actionable, associate uh, for example, a CC0 license. Um, so it's clearly in the public domain. Um, we would recommend to take the standpoint um, that attribution is actually um, a scientific norm. So it has nothing to do with a legal standpoint, but it's something that makes sense for us um, as scientists for the scientific process. And also it's a community standard of best, best practice. So we recommend to um, not put a license, a restrictive um, creative commons license, for example, on your data, because then when you want to reuse the data, you get into problems with um, license stacking and all kinds of problems when you actually want to reuse the data. So, um, be brave in a way, um, put CC0 on your, your data and assume that it's best practice that people will cite you and will attribute you. Um, and I believe if, my, if um, many of us do this, then that will be a community standard. So, and finally, we say that data is to be as open as possible and as close as necessary. So we recognize that there are data that are sensitive and where it makes sense to protect them and take into consideration that you need to go through steps of question to um, consider if you wanted to make this uh, data public or not. Um, so we wrote um, so we have a draft text for these recommendations. Um, the link is in the Zoom chat and also in, in the Slack um, thread. Um, have a look. Um, we are very happy to get your feedback, your comments, um, your improvements. Um, let us know what you think. And we have how many minutes? Okay, so we have six more minutes. So if you have feedback on that immediately, we would be really happy to hear that also from people in Zoom. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. No, um, just I, I think in, in the draft document, we should probably to second what uh, Lubo said, define what we call scientific data, because it's not as uh, it's... It's easy to understand for some of us, but I think it, it needs clarification. If we say scientific data is not copyrightable, it means that we need to define what we call scientific data.
I see quite a lot of ambiguity in the third recommendation so that we consider attribution of provenance a scientific norm. I agree, but how you can doubt that if the data are published under CC BY or the content, if they are published under such a license, then the attribution is not a scientific or ethical norm, it is a license. Yes, so like if an, a publication already exists, you have to adhere. I, I'm not a lawyer and that would be maybe Bully's answer, but uh, I think you have to adhere to this license that is attached to it. But going forward, we should consider putting it into CC0, into the public commons, and then just, yeah, then assume that it's good scientific practice to attribute. Um, Donut, so I should ask you about the, <laughs> about the CC0 license. If you have a license on the data, yeah, I think we sh you should not have a license on the data. You should have a waiver on the data. You have a license maybe on the on the publication where you have extracted the, the data. But on the data, there, there shouldn't be a license because a license means uh, you have a copyrighted work and the license allows you to do something. If you don't have a copyrighted work, you cannot have a license, even if you use this term. And uh, for example, Creative Commons has, uh, I think, uh, at least five different licenses, but they always insist that CC0 is not a license because it, uh, it makes clear that there is no copyright uh, in the game. And Therefore, it cannot be a license. CC0 is a copyright waiver, not a license. The question is, if somebody assigns the data a CC BY license. Just ignore it. <laughs> yeah. That is actually, I have a question because GBIRF allow like, gives you or recommends that you put licenses on your data. And I'm always confused about that. So, and uh, yeah, I'm, we should just ignore them, but that seems to be kind of like, I mean, we would need to have a community discussion about this, how we handle this. Just to ignore it seems to be kind of critical, but I, I think it's a process that we maybe should start to raise the awareness. And I, that's maybe why these recommendations are so important that they can be a first step in saying, Attribution is something that we do as uh, scientists. It's nothing legal. No, I I admit it's it's easy to say just ignore it, and uh, because it may have uh, undesirable effects if you really do it in a scientific community. But the the principle should be clear: um, a copyrightable work must fulfill some requirements. It must be a work, it must be original. And scientific data by default are not original. So they cannot be a copyrightable work and there cannot be a license for the use of, of scientific data. That That is the... The whole story I I try to tell, and uh, that there might be a, a practice that is that diverges from that. Uh, I know that, but um, if I look back to the last ten years, I think we have advanced considerably in the right direction. That uh, people has slowly understood that there, uh, there cannot be a, a, a copyright on, on data. And 
uh, you ha always have to remember that copyright is something objective. Mm? So if I put a, a copyright sign to, to something, that doesn't mean that it is copyrightable. It is copyrightable if it is a work, an original production, on a, in the artistic and literary domain, but uh, as I said, it includes uh, a lot of things. And if this requisition is not fulfilled, it is not the work, whatever the, the producer of this text or, or image thinks about it. Sorry for so many questions, really, but this is endless discussion. According to the EU law, you can copyright a database where you have considerable effort to collect, integrate, uh, manage the data, and so on. Is that so? In the European copyright, a database is protected if it is original, by the, uh, the election of the data and so on. And then there is a supplementary protection, which is called sui generis right. It means it's a special right, it's not a copyright. And that protects databases that are not original against some uh, uh, uses especially against the complete copying or the extracting of the, uh, the whole the database uh, in this. But it's very special and it's not copyright. Huh? It's, it's really, it's a, uh, a special uh, protection and it exists only in the European Union. It doesn't exist in the United States. It doesn't exist in Switzerland, it doesn't exist in any other country than the European Union. So I, I don't see any raised hands on the other side. And I would thank you everybody for the participation here. And I wish you now a very nice evening, good drinks, and a lot of fruitful discussions about uh, what you just heard. Thank you. And uh, as I forgot, I would like to thank all the speakers in Marika, Vili, uh, Laurence, and, and uh, Utah. Thank you. And please insist, um, uh, yes, look at the, the link at the bottom. Please look at the recommendations and we eventually would like to have your signature on it. Thank you. <laughs>